Knoxville Public Library. I'd like to say welcome. Um, we're glad that you're here to the library and also hope that you'll take advantage of our Discover NASA uh, exhibit that's out in the hallway. As you came in, you may have seen those informational pieces and there's a lot of interactive um, or cabinets, things that you can play with as well. This exhibit is part of a national tour that has been provided by the National Center of Interactive Learning, which is part of the Space Science Institute in Boulder. Funding comes from NASA, and the purpose is to get information into public libraries and, and some interactive opportunities for people to learn more about science and technology and to look at STEM careers and STEM education. So I hope that you'll take advantage of that. We'll have those pieces available to you through the end of the year and early into January. Um, since the funding comes from NASA, we do want to be able to do some reporting back to the National Center for Interactive Learning, and they'll pass that on to NASA. So I have some surveys at the back at the table. If you would take just a moment at the end, I would appreciate that. Also, you'll see the posters on the wall in the back that feature women of Goddard. Below that are some booklets that also feature women who have careers at NASA. And you're welcome to take one of those booklets with you if you'd like. Also, we have smaller versions of those posters that feel free to take as well. Um, thank you so much for coming, Dr. Walid Abdullahi. We are so pleased to have you here today. We're really fortunate, we think, to have you here. Um, he is the director of the Cooperative Series, <laughs> I thought I have to get this right, the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences in Boulder, that's with CU. Um, previously, he had spent some time, 12 years, it sounds like, at NASA, where he had received several, numer several awards and honors, including being selected to serve as the NASA Chief Scientist for two years, 2011 and 2012. It won't surprise you to know that he has an extensive list of publication as well. Um, his current research is focused on changes in the Earth's glaciers and ice sheets, how and why they are changing, and what those changes mean for life on Earth. Thank you so much for giving us some time and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Um, can you hear me OK? It's a big room. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming out. I, I realize I'm competing with a beautiful day, so I appreciate your taking the time. I'll try and make it worth your while. Um, I do have a question, though. Before I, before I drink this, is this for me, or is that? OK, good. Um, and I would like to introduce my helper. Uh, we had to use the old projector. This is my daughter, Jada, who will be advancing the slides for me. Um, so I'm, I work with satellites that study the Earth. Uh, and I apply them to the polar regions. And what I tell my kids is that dad watches ice melt from space. So that's kind of been my job for many years. So I'm going to give you a little sense of kind of what's happening and, and how we observe the ice and, and put that into a broader context. So Jada, next slide, please. Well done. So I'm going to start with a story. My apologies to my colleague, Michael King, who's heard this many times. But I think it's really good for context. I'm going to take you back to your childhood. Um, when I was little, I used to swing, just like all the other kids. But I wasn't quite like all the other kids. My, my uh, swing was my spaceship, my rocket. Um, in the late 60s, um, I was fascinated with the Apollo program, as many people were. And I used to go to my best friend, Matt Perry's house, and we would pretend we were astronauts. And what we would do is we would go in his kitchen, we would drink tang, um, delicious tang, and we'd, we'd get our football helmets, right? And we'd, we'd put them under our arms and we'd walk out, just like we'd seen on TV. We'd walk out to our spaceships. Uh, if we could, we'd have shown spotlights on them, right, to light them up at night. And we'd walk, we'd walk in slow motion, just like we saw on TV, and kind of wave to our fans and point and hey there. And we would get on our swings and we would swing like all the other kids, but we would swing as high as we could and we'd pretend we were sailing through space. And then we'd land. And we'd land on the moon, 
right there in Matt's backyard, we'd land on the moon. And um, we would explore. And then we'd get on our swing, swing some more, and then we'd go back to the kitchen and have some more tang, talk about our adventures. And so it was Matt's tang, Matt's house, Matt's yard, Matt's swing. So he always got to be Neil Armstrong. Uh, but I got to be Buzz Aldrin. And occasionally there would be a third kid. And we'd let him be Michael Collins, but we'd never let him off the swing. He had to stay on the swing while we were exploring our lunar scape. And you know, kids can be kind of cruel that way. But we had fun. Uh, well, two of us had fun. Um, so I would, honey, I need you to advance. So I was, um, you know, a, a child of the early, of the Apollo years. And uh, if you could advance, Jada, next. <laughs> That's OK. But in that time, NASA showed us something I think every bit as profound as landing on the moon. Um, and it was this view of ourselves, Jada. This perspective, don't sit down, honey, because it's gonna be, it's gonna be. This perspective, Earthrise, um, Christmas 1968. Um, go back one, honey. So the, this perspective really made us look at ourselves differently, how we viewed the Earth. Suspended in space, right? One Earth, one system of interaction. Another perspective NASA showed next is this from the Voyager spacecraft out past uh, Pluto, turn around, looking back at the Earth, okay? what we call a pale blue dot. Next. And Carl Sagan said at that time, from this distant vantage point, Earth might not seem of any particular interest. Next. And this is pale blue dot, but in Saturn, uh, in Saturn's rings. Next. So this is from the Cassini spacecraft. And he said, for us, it's different. Next. That's here. That's home. That's us. Okay. So the reason I show these is the space-based perspective of the Earth, this is Earth at night, really changes the way we look at ourselves. And this is an Earth, as you can tell by the lights, that's alive, that's full of uh, energy, that's full of activity. Next slide. And can you start the movie? But it's also an Earth on the move, OK? This is just one day of air aircraft flights. I love this. You can see in the night all the planes moving from the United States to Europe. And then back as the daylight comes, you see the convergence in Western Europe. And then as the sun starts to rise in Western Europe, you start to see the emergence from that area. So we have a huge fingerprint. A lot of people have said to me in the past, you know, it, I just don't see how we can make this much of a difference on the planet, how we can have that much of a fingerprint. I look at this stuff, and I ask the opposite question. How can we not? Right, so next slide. And the movie? So what I study is the Arctic, and a little bit of the Antarctic, but mostly the Arctic. And the Arctic is a very dynamic place. It's got sea ice over the Arctic Ocean that comes and goes with the seasons. It's got glaciers in northern Canada, Alaska, Russia, and mostly Greenland, which is where I'm going to spend um, most of uh, my time talking. Um, next slide. And I, the Arctic affects us. The Arctic matters, basically, for three reasons. Okay, One of the first, actually, if you go back, honey, one of the first is that it's highly reflective. It, it reflects a lot of the Earth's sunlight back to space and helps keep the planet cool. Another reason is because as you see this dynamic, as it starts to melt, it rejects salt. Actually, as it freezes, it, it rejects salt into the upper surface of the ocean okay, and makes the top of the ocean dense, which then sinks. And then as it melts, it freshens the ocean. And these processes affect ocean circulation. If you go to the next slide, the third, and why I study the ice sheets, is they affect sea level rise. These areas in red are areas that would be affected by a one meter sea level rise, which is not really out of the question for the end of this century. 
Um, it's estimated to affect 145 million people at the cost of nearly a trillion dollars U.S. worldwide. So it matters. Now, there are seven meters of sea level equivalent locked up in the Greenland ice sheet, about 58 meters sea level equivalent in the Antarctic ice sheet, and um, a couple feet in the rest of the glaciers and ice caps all over the world. Sorry I had to change units on you there. Uh, next slide. Thank you. This is a close-up of the southeastern United States. Same one meter sea level rise, just to give you a sense. The Everglades, the western coast of Florida, lots of the east coast, Louisiana, the Mississippi Delta. So it matters. What's going on in these places really matters. Next. Um, now, currently, oceans are rising about 3.2, 3.3 millimeters a year. Over the last century, it was about half of that. But in the past, over the last 15,000 years, there have been periods when it's risen um, on the order of 10 times that, right? five meters in one century. So it matters what's happening there. Next slide. So this is a picture from some field work that I uh, used to do before I got a desk job, I guess, back when the research was more fun. Um, but I show this because this is a weather station. There's a temperature sensor on here, a humidity sensor on here, and something that measures the depth of the snow. Okay. The measurement environment is very difficult. Next. This is why we do it from space, in part. Um, it's costly. It's dangerous. In case you can't tell, this is the plane. This is the wheel. Um, these things happen, and one has to be careful. Fortunately, there are tents and supplies, so uh, nobody was hurt, but it's very inconvenient when this happens. I studied aerospace engineering for six years, so I know that that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> Next slide. Um, but the other issue is one of context and scale and perspective. How do you turn an observation of, you know, you make a measurement in a location of, you know, how much salt is in this, how much is flowing down, what the temperature is. Your instrument is bigger than your ice flow. How do you turn that into something meaningful about the Earth, about the Arctic as a whole? Next slide. So going from that to something like this. Well, the way we do this is with satellite observations and aircraft observations. I won't go through all of this except to say all of these things we're observing from space with different kinds of sensors um, that act in parts of the spectrum that measure things at wavelengths that your eyes can't see. But there's information in these. Okay? And this is what NASA does all over the Earth. My area in particular is the Arctic. So these are the phenomena we look at. Um, iceberg calving, where the ice comes afloat as it flows into the sea how it's moving, how much melt there is, how much mass there is, how much energy it's reflecting versus absorbing, how much, um, what the temperature is and how the temperatures are changing. Next. Honey, are you getting tired? I can switch, I can switch you out. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. So um, one thing I worked with extensively is ISAT, laser altimeter. Satellite flies along fires laser pulses at the surface below, measures the travel time for the laser light to reach the surface and come back, and from that we can figure out how high the surface is below. We do this over and over and over, and then we get changes in the height of the ice sheet because that tells us how much it's growing or shrinking, what it is or is not contributing to sea level rise. Next. Another way we measure how much the ice is growing or shrinking is with a pair of satellites called GRACE, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. So there are two satellites flying around, one behind the other. And when it gets over a big mass, like Greenland or Antarctica, the gravity from Greenland or Antarctica pulls the first one and leaves the second one where it is until the second one approaches, and that gets pulled. And then this one starts to slow down once it passes this ice block underneath it. So by measuring how much the satellites separate as they're passing over the ice, we can figure out how the ice is growing or shrinking. If it's growing, there's more mass. The satellites separate by, more, uh, by a greater distance. Next slide. 
So this is the calving front of the Jakobsavn ice stream right here in Greenland, fastest glacier in the world. Um, when I started studying it, it was traveling at 17 kilometers uh, per year. Okay, next slide. This is where the action is. This is where it happens. If you can start the movie, please. Thank you. So now we're going to zoom into the Jakobsavn ice stream. This is all from satellite imagery, different satellite sensors. We're going to zoom in. It's right here. Okay, and we're going to look at the calving front and the glacier speeds. But first, we're going to stop for a minute. And I want to call your attention to these blue dots. These are melt ponds. These are lakes on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet that fill with water as it melts, because the surface has these undulations. So they're little basins, just like lakes, um, just like Harper Lake here in Louisville, but on an ice surface. So we can observe the icebergs, we can observe the calving front, and we can, by watching features move, we can track the velocity of the ice stream. This is the main ice stream, this is a tributary, and what you see above is drawdown. It's ice that's getting pulled into the ice stream. So this is the calving front, and a funny thing, well, it's not funny, but an interesting thing happened um, beginning about 2003. The calving front started to retreat. The ice started to back up. And when it did, the force that it exerted, it, it's, it's wedged between these two rock outcrops and holding back the ice flow. So when it did, that resistive force was removed, and the ice started flushing out. So instead of seven kilometers an hour, it started going 14 kilometers an hour. The fastest glacier in the world doubled its speed. Now, if you look at this, what you're seeing now is measurements in topography from ISAT. So you see the dimple on the left. You see all these dark colors in here. This is shrinking. This is collapsing of the ice as it's flowing out to the sea super fast by glacier standards. 14 kilometers a year is five feet an hour. So you can actually stand at the edge of one rock, look across at the other, and your eye can see the glacier move through your field of view. This is a big deal. We don't see this much in, well, hardly ever in glaciers. Next slide. And so I mentioned that started in about 2000, I think I said 2003, I should have said 2001, I'm sorry. About a kilometer a year, it had been stable for about 50 years, but in a, a five, six, seven, eight year period, it retreated the equivalent of the previous 100 years. So the ice is on the move, or the ice is on the retreat, and that has implications for sea level rise. Next slide. Uh, one of the things we can detect is melt on the ice sheet by using microwave emission, the energy that comes off in microwave frequencies. And there was a day in 2012 where the entire, well, 97% of the ice sheet melted. We see this from a spacecraft called, this wasn't microwave, this was visible, a spacecraft called MODIS, or an instrument on a spacecraft. Uh, the instrument is called MODIS. Um, this is a more typical year, a few days earlier, but on this day, it got very wet. The surface got very wet. Now, the reason I show this, this happens. This roughly happens every 80 years or so. So this is a meteorological phenomenon. Weather comes in, makes the surface warm. This doesn't really say anything about what's happening to the ice sheet. But longer term, the next slide, we can look at melt over, oh, I'm sorry. It's the ice cores that tell us that this has happened before. We get. No, you're fine. We get an ice core from the middle, okay, from the summit station around here. And you can tell by the layering, this is where the 80 years or so comes from on average. It gets wet. It melts a little. Next slide. Much more importantly, though, is the trend in melt. This is where we use the microwave data. And this is back to 1979, where we have the data. And you can see 2012 was a huge melt year. That day was just sort of one manifestation of that. But averaged over the summer melt months, the melt is increasing substantially. And we can tell this because you see in this image, this is white, this is blue. This is giving off much more energy at microwave wavelengths where your eyes can't see. So we can detect melt in that way, track it over time, and we're seeing the increased melt in the Greenland ice sheet. Next slide. 
I talked about the melt lakes. Um, there are hundreds of them in these basins. They can drain very rapidly. They're anywhere from the size of, um, I don't know, a, a kilometer or so to 10 kilometers or 10 miles. There are some that are huge. We can see these from space. This image is from here. Next slide. This is what they look like. Uh, and you can see this hole here. I'll tell you the significance of that in a minute and the crevasses around it. Next. Um, so what can happen is the water fills these crevasses and sometimes the weight of the water pries them open. Or that hole I was talking to you about, it's what's called a moulin. It goes deep into the ice, all the way to the bottom. And the meltwater can start to drain quickly, flow like a river into that hole. Next slide. So this is a movie. Can you start that? That just shows that. The pressure from the water builds up as the melt pond fills. It forces its way in through these channels in the ice to the bottom moves across the bottom of the ice, makes this slippery, and the ice speeds up in the summertime, where it goes about twice as fast in the summer as it does in the winter. Next. Um, all of these factors, the speeding up of the ice sheet at the margin, the increased melt rate, the summertime acceleration, ultimately contribute to sea level rise. We have a record, also from space, since 1993 of what the oceans have been doing. And they've been going up, um, I think, yeah, I said 3.2 earlier. That was an old number. After this, the last two years, it's 3.3 millimeters a year. It's not that much, right? It's about the thickness of a dime. But you start to think about a stack of dimes over the, over the um, 10 years, 20 years, and so on, and you start to think of some of the shallow slopes and coastal areas, it makes a huge difference. But there's a lot of variability to it. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, weather and short-term climate events affect that. We actually had a significant decrease um, in 2010 as we went, as we were in an El Nino year and then transitioning to a La Nina year, um, the sea level, because the ocean got colder, went down. The ocean contracts. Okay? It expands when it warms, it contracts when it gets bigger. So um, there's going to be a lot of variability. But the longer term trend, 3.3 millimeters a year, is very robust and likely to get greater. Next slide. Um, so that's ice sheets and sea level. I'm going to talk now a little bit about sea ice. So sea ice is just this thin veneer of frozen ocean surface water that traps heat in the ocean. As I said earlier, it reflects sunlight back to space. It uh, puts salt into the ocean that affects the ocean circulation. So it affects ocean temperature, density, and circulation characteristics, which ultimately affect the climate down here at lower latitudes. Next slide. So as I showed before, there are things we measure from space, from satellites. We measure the concentration of the ice, how much there is. We measure its movement. We measure how thick it is. We measure how reflective it is. Um, and we measure how it deforms, and we measure its temperature. Next. And the summer or the cycle, the annual cycle of ice is it grows in the winter, shrinks in the summer. And one of the things we keep track of is this minimum right there. You see it expand the maximum in winter. And watch again, right there is the minimum. Okay? Why we care about that is, one, for climate purposes, because how small that gets has significant impacts on climates worldwide. The other is for economic purposes, because um, there's been a long interest in shipping, right? Being able to navigate the Northwest Passage to get from Europe over here to Asia over here without taking the long way. Um, many, many millions of dollars at stake associated with that for commercial shipping. So next slide. There you go. So this is what the ice has been doing again since 1979. Uh, it goes up. This is the minimum, that smallest extent. It goes up, it goes down. But 
for the most part, it's been on a downward trend. And the Arctic is opening up. That has huge implications both for climate and for fishing uh, next, and commerce. Next slide. So this is a typical year, at least how it used to be from 1984. It's not a particularly big ice year. It's not a particularly small ice year. And then the minimum in 2012, next slide. This is closer to the new state of ice. Now, I'm not quite being fair because this was 2012. This was the lowest year. But this is much more representative of where we've been in the last few years than the earlier slide has shown. So the ice is shrinking. Next slide. Um, that's the trend I showed you earlier. This is kind of the average historical ice edge of how it used to be. Um, this is what it was like for the minimum in 2015. The whiter it is, the thicker it is, the more concentrated it is as well. The grayer it is, the thinner it is. Now, an interesting thing happened. In 2007, we had a really low year, and this area opened up. And next, honey. And people scrambled for the Northwest Passage. This is a picture of a retired hog farmer from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, 76 years old, sailed it in 73 days, sailed the Northwest Passage from, from here over to here. Um, first time it had been done in a long time. Now, it had been done before in 1903, 4, and 5. And when I say that, I don't mean it was done three times. I mean it was done in the span, 1903, 4, 5, by Roald Amundsen, a famous Arctic and Antarctic explorer. Um, and I love this picture because I see the hog farmer and his wife um, posing for their selfie, you know, happy with their successful voyage. And I can't help but wonder if the ghost of Roald Amundsen, next slide, honey, uh, wouldn't be looking over their shoulders. Look at this guy. You see the difference between the two? This is what three years in the Northwest Passage will do to you as opposed to 73 days in the Northwest Passage. And, and I'm sure there was a big deal. You know, when I was your age, we, well, he never made it to their age. When I did the Northwest Passage, it was, um, you know, you can imagine the stories he might, or the disdain with which he may look on this accomplishment. To date, um, the number of applicants uh, to to sail this, for, for shipping permits to sail this, is in the thousands. I believe it's in the thousands. So from nobody to at least hundreds of people trying to do this. Uh, times are changing, and it has implications. Next slide. Uh, and one way we can measure ice thickness, which is very important for the Navy, for example, um, you know, they're trying to figure out what their icebreaker should look like or be capable of, is there are these um, openings called leads in the Arctic ice cover. And the same technology, the laser technology, also with radar, that measures um, height or surface can measure thickness because it measures the height of the water, the height of the ice. And by looking at the difference between the two, you get freeboard. And by adjusting for density, you can figure out how thick the ice is, how much ice is below the surface. So we use this capability to measure thickness and changes in thickness in the ice cover. So I mentioned commercial. I mentioned for climatological purposes. I just now touched on uh, strategic interests, military purposes, because there's a whole new theater of operations opening up in the Arctic. An ice-free Arctic changes things substantially. Next slide. So this is just an image of thickness estimated in this way. Um, this is a satellite image, a picture of the ice cover, and this is the estimates of thickness based on freeboard. This is the height above the water. So from that, the ice is about nine times deeper in the water than it is above the water. We get thickness. Um, next slide. And when we look at that information, actually hit it again, please. We look at that info, one more. We look at that information, and what we see is we've got thick ice piled up over Greenland and Canada, um, thin ice uh, over Western North America and Eastern Europe. This was 2003 on the left. 
2007 on the right, you see the thin ice is gone and the thick ice is getting less and less. Now this is only over a short time span because this is where we've had the capabilities. Next slide. When we combine it um, with other information, we can uh, estimate the age of the sea ice, partly by how thick it is and partly by how salty it is. How salty it is affects the energy it gives off. And so what we're seeing here is um, first year ice, second year ice here, and multi-year ice, older than two years. And how that changed between 1981, um, well, the 80s and 90s, and 2009. Okay. So when you put the two slides together, the ice is getting younger right here, and it's getting thinner which to me sounds great for people, but for ice, that's a very bad thing. We don't want that. That affects, that has a huge impact on climate. Next slide. Um, I put this in because these changes are uh, coming about for a number of reasons, but the primary driver is greenhouse gases. And I don't want to make this a, you know, scold the world for using greenhouse gases. I simply want to point something out quite significant. Uh, the first statement, there's general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. Carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. Present thinking is that we have a window of about five to 10 years before we really start needing to make some hard decisions um, regarding changes in our energy strategies. These could have been said by anyone at any time over the last few decades. It's actually been 50 years since the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology first told President Johnson, greenhouse gases are warming the climate and there are implications for the future. This statement was made in 1977 by a scientific advisor, a senior scientist at Exxon, telling his people there are impacts on the climate that the burning of our product is creating, or are creating, excuse me. And we don't have much time to figure out what to do about it. Okay. It was 1977. I'm guessing he didn't get promoted after that, but. You know, the point is, people knew it, people know it now, even people who stood to uh, suffer financially from acknowledging it, acknowledged it. The scientists, the data, really can't be disputed. Um, this is a, when I stumbled on this two days ago, I didn't realize he had said this. Um, this is really significant that this person at this time was saying this thing to these people. And our five to 10 years have passed and a lot of the hard choices have not been made yet. Next slide. Next. So what I wanna leave you with is the idea that climatologically, we're in unfamiliar territory. The earth has not known an ice-free Arctic in summer for as near as we can tell, hundreds of thousands of years. Humans have never experienced this. And we're well on our way to that. It may be in 2030, 2040, 2100, I don't know. But we're on our way to that. And the implications could be quite substantial. Now, there are a few responses to that. Um, next slide. This is one. I'll let you insert your own joke here. Uh, but, um, you know, our, how we how we meet this challenge is going to determine our success as a society. We can ignore the challenge, we can confront the challenge, and there's sort of, there's a spectrum of, of responses that people are choosing to exercise. But the Arctic is telling us something. We're, it's very convincingly telling us it's changing, it's changing substantially, and it's changing in ways that matter to the rest of the world. Next slide. And this is a very long quote, but since I showed you the picture of Amundsen, the, the guy in black and white with the long face, um, I, I think this is worth putting up. So this was his statement in response to having successfully navigated the Northwest Passage. How did you do it? You know, the masses want to know. And he said, 
I must say that this is the greatest factor. The way in which the expedition is equipped, the way in which every difficulty is foreseen and precautions taken for meeting or avoiding it. Victory awaits him who has everything in order. Luck, people call it. Defeat is certain for him who has neglected to take the necessary precautions in time. This is called bad luck. The reason I put this up is because Amundsen was on a voyage. He knew there were going to be challenges. He equipped himself to meet those challenges. It was probably very inconvenient to bring along all the things he needed to bring along just in case. But he did it. And in so doing, he accomplished a feat which for the day was not that different from the landing on the moon for the day. So there were probably kids in, I don't know, their bathtubs pretending they were Roald Amundsen sailing the Northwest Passage just like I was on my swing pretending I was, I was Buzz Aldrin. Um, <laughs> this is not that different from the journey we're on now as a collective society. Anticipating what may lie ahead and figuring out strategies to meet them, meet those challenges, and executing. That really was the ingredients, were the ingredients for his success. I think those are the ingredients for our success. Next slide. So I'll leave it with that. A little sunrise or a sunset, depending on whether you're a pessimist or an optimist. Um, and I just want to say thank you for your time, and I'm happy to ask any questions. I had a movie, but it won't play on what we have here. So I'll just give you a little more time for questions. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Well, I can't help but wonder whether what you think of the uh, relationship between this. And oh yeah, this is being recorded. Um, so, uh, Hurricane Patricia um, is and um, El Nino. So this is a this is a very good question. When you have uh, what I believe is the most uh, intense hurricane ever experienced in the Western Hemisphere. Um, happening against the backdrop of climate change. We can't say that one event is a result of the changing climate. What we can say is the changing climate stacks the odds that make an event like this more likely. So an analogy I use sometimes is if, if I'm at half court shooting a basketball and I take 100 shots at the hoop, I might make a couple. If I take three steps forward and I take another, I'll make a couple more, maybe. And, and I keep doing that. I will progressively make more and more shots. But I can never say I made this shot because I got closer to the basket. Um, because I made some from half court. At least I'm hoping I would out of 100 shots. So, so you can't say, well, this is because of that. All you can say are conditions are such that an occurrence like this is more likely, which isn't satisfying, doesn't give you good sound bites, and doesn't make it into the press. Um, but that's, that's the simple truth. Anything else? Yes? Um, one of ideas about why um, the greenhouse gases, especially CO2, are not captured by, say, plants and don't become part of the, the food chain and, and just enhance the number of living. They, they are being captured. The, the greenhouse, well, carbon dioxide in particular, is being captured by plants, by phytoplankton in the ocean. There's an enormous uptake. But it's a simple arithmetic problem. More is being put into the atmosphere than can be removed for it. Now, interestingly, um, there have been suggestions or plans and technologies to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, carbon capture, where as, as a factory generates the carbon dioxide, you capture the gas, filter out the CO2, and pump it deep into the ground again, you know, where it had sat for millions of years in the first place. Um, that's a man-made approach. It's not terribly effective or scalable at this point. It can be done in, in a small amount, a small environment. Um, plants are doing us a huge service, but we're dwarfing them uh, in terms of the CO2 we're putting out. Anything else? Yes? Uh, you have a microphone. Which one? 
<laughs> um, so we're doing certain things to try to prevent pollution and solar energy and all that kind of stuff. How much of a difference is that making? That's a really good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, because there's so many factors involved. You can ask how much of a difference is making in this country, but you still have India and China um, uh, where coal is the primary source of energy. So I think it's more, if we were to take all of these steps in this country and triple our solar power, solar energy uh, use and wind generated energy and so forth, we'd still be losing ground if other nations weren't doing it. So but the secret's to get the other nations to do it too? Uh, the secret is to show leadership. And um, I, I don't want to say get the other nations to do it, but I will say it's very easy for the developing world to look at the United States and say, well, they got there through the very means they're telling us to stop doing. And they don't seem to be doing much themselves. So why should we? You know, it's, it's very hard to generate a, a global action when um, the leading powers don't undertake, don't demonstrate or make some sacrifices themselves. So I think the real strength in adopting solar energy and wind energy, sure, there is a contribution, um, but is really in leading by example. gentleman in the red hat. <laughs> Hi. I just, it seemed like a lot of the technology being used in these slides or that you were showing are relatively, they've been in place for decades. Huh. Are there... Oh, you mean the observing capabilities? But like, like, like Grace and those different satellites? Yeah, there... Grace went up in 90 or 2003. Yeah, 2002, three. Um, by the way, this is my friend Michael King who Senior scientist at Goddard, when I was just a budding scientist, kind of, kind of took me under his wing and gave me many professional chances. So uh, that's why I look to him when I don't know the answers. But Grace was about 2003. ISAT was 2003 to 2009. Um, the longer records, the sea level and the microwave, what the sea ice is doing, are um, sea level to 93. The others to about 79. So a decade to three. In there. I was just wondering, along those lines, is the funding going to continue to study the sea ice using those methods, or are there other cutting-edge methods or new emerging technologies to study the sea ice? Um, well, the funding isn't going to continue. It's been declining. Uh, interestingly, in uh, it was about 2,000, I think. The Earth Science budget 2000 was about $2 billion in $2,000 then, and it got as low as about 1.2, and now I think it's back up to about 1.5, just at NASA. Um, some of these are defense satellites. Some of the tools are, uh, at, are NOAA satellites. A lot of the sort of pioneering stuff, figuring out how to look at things, are NASA satellites. The stresses on the budget are such that um, you kind of have to choose what do you continue versus what kinds of new observations do you need to make to understand. And this is something that actually the decadal survey, a two-year effort, is going to seek to identify. What are the science? What are the observing priorities? How do we balance continuity versus new measurements? So that's, um, I can answer that question in two years, but for now that, that effort's just starting. Some of it will continue. The defense stuff, the microwave, the main thing we track the ice with is from a defense meteorological satellite program. So um, that, that will be ongoing because the military uses it for its own uh, tactical needs. So, um, but new observations, we're working to figure out new ways of looking at things in cheaper, uh, more cost-effective manner. So it's still emerging. Oh, that's fine, honey. You can just leave it. You can just leave it. Anything else? 
All right. Well, I appreciate your time. I'll let you get out and enjoy the afternoon. Um, but thank you for taking the time and hearing what I have to say. This is important stuff. I hope, if nothing else, you, you leave here and you think about it for a while. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I am extremely Googleable. Uh, there is no other Walid Abdullahi out there. Uh, actually, one one did try to friend me on Facebook, but he spelled his name differently. Um, so, if you have questions you think of later, feel free to email me or uh, contact me by some other means. So, thank you. Thank you so much. You can, honey. <laughs>